we get started, good evening everyone, it's 7 o'clock. I think everyone's had at least one slice of cake. Uh, I'd like to rec recall, uh, I start every class with a, a saint of the, of the day, but tonight's theme is on the development of doctrine and one of the giants of this whole area in theology is St. John Cardinal Newman. And so I thought we would begin with uh, prayers he wrote and uh, remember him uh, this evening. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. God has created me to do some definite service. He has committed some work to me which he has not committed to another. I have my mission. I may never know it in this life, but I shall be told it in the next. I am a link in a chain, a bond of connection between persons. He has not created me for naught. I shall do good. I shall do his work. I shall be an angel of peace, a preacher of truth in my own place, while not intending it, if I do but keep his commandments. Therefore, I will trust him. Whatever I am, I can never be thrown away. If I am in sickness, my sickness may serve him. In perplexity, my perplexity may serve him. If I am in sorrow, my sorrow may serve him. He does nothing in vain. He knows what he is about. He may take away my friends. He may throw me among strangers. He may make me feel desolate, make my spirit sink, hide my future from me. Still, he knows what he is about. And so, may the Lord support us all the day long till the shades lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in his mercy, may he give us safe lodging and holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. John Cardinal Newman was a 19th century uh, figure who was part of the Oxford movement that uh, had several noteworthy Anglicans convert to Catholicism. And he was one of those in the 19th century, late 19th century, and was very influential uh, theologically at Vatican II as well as on tonight's topic. So tonight's topic is kind of a grab bag of other topics from the council, but the core thing we will review tonight is really the development of doctrine, which is uh, a, a title that you'll see even in course curricula entitled Development of Doctrine. Uh, it's that significant of a topic. And so what we'll cover tonight is the development of doctrine, which is really answering the question, what is authentic development versus corruptions or mutations? There's a difference between development of doctrine and corruptions or mutations. We'll then spend some time on the decree on religious liberty, which was a development of doctrine that was much, uh, much heat on at the time of the council and even if, if you recall a figure named uh, Bishop Marcel Lefebvre, who started the St. Pius X movement, which broke away from the Catholic Church momentarily, uh, big promoters of the Latin Mass in its Tridentine form, as you know, he had a problem with this decree as well. So uh, it, it comes from a, a, a worldview that actually influenced him liturgically as well, which we don't have time to get into, but I might make a few comments about him in passing uh, that will shed some light on where he was coming from. Thomas Aquinas and the Analogy of Being. Uh, this will be a, a little bit technical. I'll try to make it light and entertaining. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the claim that some of the leading theologians of the time made is that Thomas Aquinas was the figure at Vatican II, which you might say, how could that be? He's a classical theologian, orthodox, the greatest father of the church, and I thought Vatican II was this modern thing that did away with Aquinas and Thomism. And actually, it made use of one of his conceptions, not necessarily original with him, on this thing called the analogy of being. And what does that mean? We'll unpack that as the framework that Vatican II was operating out of, actually. And then lastly, just an assessment of the council, uh, and it's really an ongoing event, as I put it here, and as Matthew Levering in his book, In Your Bibliography, puts it, we're not done. <laughs> Some would say we haven't started, 
Um, and if you look at the history of councils, uh, for example, from the time of Council of Nicaea, where we get the Nicene Creed, 325 AD, to 451 at the Council of Chalcedon, you had 130 years there of controversy. So perhaps we're just getting started, or we're at the midway point of working out what Vatican II really means. So don't lose heart today. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, this idea of the development of doctrine, how can the Catholic Church change, uh, hovered over the councils in the atmosphere in the entire 19th and 20th century of how can the Catholic Church change? If the Church is in possession of the truths of faith, what more needs to be added? Why should we even go further? It's just a matter of educating people on what those truths are. And you might remember in class one, I held up a catechism from 1858, which was the precursor to the Baltimore Catechism. And it was in Q&A form. What is the purpose of life? Can the goods of this earth bring happiness? Yes, no, no, no. And, and that is one approach to try to re-evangelize the world. Uh, and what the church was after is we have to do better than that because that's not working. That's not speaking to the masses as we uh, noted in that first class. And yet, again, the church teaches if Revelation ended with the death of St. John, the last apostle, the youngest apostle likely, um, how can we say there's such a thing as development of doctrine without compromising what was revealed by the apostles and in the New Testament and so forth? How does doctrine throughout time develop in the first place? This is a popular conception among fallen away Catholics and non-Catholic Christians of you Catholics are constantly adding things. Things like Mary and the Immaculate Conception, papal infallibility, all these liturgical bells and smells, as it used to be called, incense and bells. Um, what is this with all of these barnacles accruing to the ship that you Catholics are always up to and always doing? You're always adding things to the simple old-time religion that we find you know, in the New Testament with togas and people walking around with sandals and... So why are you doing more than that? No middlemen between me and God is a very common conception, not only among fallen away Catholics and non-Christians, but people in general. Why do you have this religion that is so elaborate with your doctrines, your catechisms, your this, your that? Why all the middlemen? Very popular. Very popular among your children or grandchildren. Um, and so as we roll, you know, graphically speaking, you know, the, uh, a, a painting of the Last Supper, uh, circa 33 AD, plus or minus, how do we go from this simple scene of the Last Supper with all of its tenderness to Pope Pius XII in 1955 being carried into St. Peter's uh, on a chair with all this ornate Renaissance uh, with people holding him up, an honor guard, all of this kind of gaudy, uh, overdone celebration. What happened to the simple Christianity that we all uh, think is off the real authentic thing? You know, this goes hand in hand. The church's showmanship goes hand in hand with this kind of, the world looks at this and says, what are you doing with all of this? You know, what happened to the simple preaching of Jesus? Which they're not going to follow anyway, but this is at least a hammer on that. If you think about it, the issue of development arises in the first place because Jesus didn't come back in the lifetime of the apostles. He didn't come back yet. Some thought that he was coming back sooner rather than later. As I've mentioned many times, Think of, again, St. Paul, who initially thought uh, in Thess 1 Thessalonians that Jesus was coming back within his lifetime. Jesus did not come back in the apostles' lifetime. And so the issue of development, you can see, comes from this obvious fact that Jesus did not, the second coming has not occurred yet. And so the, the, it's, the implication is that God willed that his revelation, his saving message, 
should be poured out over time and space in history. That God can fully reveal himself, not just in a first century burst of energy, but rather in an unfolding. Think of the wonderful saints that have been produced, not only in the first century, but throughout time. The wonderful examples we have of li Christian living in different cultural, historical contexts. It's almost as if the universe, universality of God is revealed in time and history much more fully than just Jesus of Nazareth in the first century. And why can we say that? Because the church continues as Jesus on earth corporately as the body of Christ. So there's an implication that development actually is part of God's will for revealing himself fully to humanity. We have uh, examples of the institution of the church from the words of Jesus to Peter. Uh, you think of uh, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Think of in Luke's gospel the instructions at the Last Supper when he looks at Peter and says Satan has asked to sift you all like wheat but I prayed for thee that your faith will not fail and that you will strengthen your brethren. Uh, or again in John's gospel uh, Peter's triple denial on Good Friday is then countermanded by his triple, triple affirmation of love on the beach with Jesus post-resurrection. Uh, and so you have this, this resuscitation of the apostolic college with Peter as their head. You know, to replace Judas, why replace Judas? You know, why do that if Jesus is coming soon and he doesn't want this to continue? So even within the resurrection period of visions of Jesus, the apostles select Matthias to replace Judas to maintain the 12. That college, that apostolic band was critical to their understanding of what their mission and task was and, cont and continues uh, through the succession of bishops back to the apostles. So right away, uh, those who think that uh, you know, development and everything that comes after is, is somehow a human institution only that is just obscuring the message, the simple message of Jesus, are, are mistaken. Uh, we know that the church that Jesus Christ instituted now preaches and what I call mediates. Mediates means a go-between, a mediator, maybe a family mediator, or you're negotiating a treaty between countries, there's often mediation, mediators. Jesus Christ is the supreme mediator between God and men and women because he was God and he was man. He can bridge humanity and God because he has a foot in both areas. And so this is already mediated when you think about it. This, I don't want any middlemen in between me and God, uh, it's too late. Uh, as, I, as I point out here, uh, there are developments already in the New Testament time frame. You think of the disputes between Peter and Paul on what do we do with the Gentiles. Uh, you think about the selection of the New Testament texts themselves was done by this college, this institution, already mediated. There is no true me and the book access. It's already been mediated by a selection and editing process of an institution. So in some ways, Bible-only faiths rely on the apostolic tradition of the Catholic Church for the very existence of the New Testament. So my point is that we already have this ecclesial mediation going on from the beginning. Of course, the true exemplar of mediation, as I mentioned, is Jesus Christ. He makes God present. He reveals God to us in human form. That is a form of mediation. And as I point out here, philosophically, we never have direct access to God in himself anyway. A finite being cannot encompass an infinite being, which God is. So if you, th again, this is philosophical, but your senses, your imagination, your thoughts are all reflections and mediations of reality. 
when I look outside and I see the vehicles parked in the parking lot, a chunk of the vehicle isn't in my brain physically, but rather my imagination brings that to my, my mind and I reflect on it. It's mediated. So my conceptual world, my imaginary world, the senses are all forms of mediation of reality. Mediation does not mean I can't make real contact. But for those who say no middlemen, already philosophically or psychologically, you are already in a, in a form of mediation in any human experience. God can make real contact with us through that mediation, grace in our soul. But as I point out here, grace is still a property of our soul. We don't have it essentially or by nature. Grace is a property that God can confer on us, sanctifying grace uh, through prayer, through the sacramental life, through doing virtuous things, through avoiding mortal sin, uh, and so on. So grace is in the soul. Grace inhabits our senses and our imagination when we fill it with the proper images. And we are making contact in that sense. But grace is in us incidentally, whereas in God it's the nature of God. And so there's still the mediation of finite reality bridging to the divine. So we never get away from mediation. Why am I harping on this so much? This is the area where development can occur. Why? Because when God makes contact with humanity in history, that is always mediated in history. We are in time. We're not just a nature outside of time. We are in time. We are in history. We are in a culture that speaks a language. And so that's really the, the point I make at the bottom is that um, this mediation occurs in a context, in a community. And so the, the approach of me and my Bible or me thinking alone is a historical. It's, it's irrational because it doesn't uh, explain where did this book come from, who wrote the table of contents. And by the way, your thinking and feeling has been shaped by a family that raised you, and so on, and so on, and so on. So every experience you have is already mediated. And therefore, as God, as we as faithful people reflect on God's revelation, that will develop over time. So this is really a critical concept to understand and how to respond to People who say, you Catholics, uh, all this stuff about Mary is not in the Bible. You know, all this stuff about uh, the sacraments, not in the Bible. Maybe baptism they'll give us. Um, and so this is what's going on. And the way to challenge that is to go back and say, well, let's talk about how faith comes in the first place. And it's always through mediation, which means ultimately always through a development, as well as an institution that pre-exists in the first place. So the basis then for what follows is how do we then distinguish true development from corruptions, from tradition, capital T, sacred tradition, capital T, from what I call tradition, small t, ways of doing things. Uh, time-honored practices, and so on. So examples, the dogma of the Trinity is a dogma of faith. Three persons, one divine nature. That's part of our faith. The selection of holy days of obligation, would you put that on the same level? You wouldn't. That's more of a housekeeping rule. Uh, it's a tradition small t. The Trinity is a tradition, capital T. You follow me? Uh, real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, sacred tradition, capital T. The papal states complete with armies. Some people thought that was part of the deposit of faith. It's a tradition, small t, and maybe not even a good tradition, small t. Baptism of desire that Vatican II talked about, sacred tradition, capital T. 
limbo or the general fate of the unbaptized. Saints talked about them, unfortunately, suffering the fires of hell in former times. Or, or limbo was kind of a, a compromise. Well, we, we don't like the imagery of unbaptized babies in hell, so we'll just kind of create a, a kind of middle area, a holding area of no, no major torments, no major delights, kind of something that we don't have. So you see how that's never been an official teaching of the church. It's a tradition small t which means it can be annulled or reformulated, uh, which we'll get to. Um, so what we're talking about, one more tough word, Greek word, hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. You might say, Charles, what on earth is that? Well, hermeneutics comes from a Greek word uh, meaning to interpret, <laughs> but it really comes from Hermes, the, the messenger god, the god of interpretation. Uh, he was kind of the go-between between between the gods and humanity. And he was also a prankster and a trickster. And and so the Greeks loved this imagery of that all interpretation uh, certainly involves a a, a measure of this go-between mediation, but there's also always elements of the fantastic. And so Hermes or or Mercury might have heard that name in the the Roman version, or if you're a fan of... uh, Gustav Holtz and the Planets, that symphony, he, he's referred to as the messenger god in the notes to the album or the CDs that you might purchase. So hermeneutics is the science of interpretation. And you might say, well, what's, what, what is that? You know, thanks for that little thing on Hermes. But uh, uh, if you walk into a library, and you'll do this unconsciously, you walk into Lake Forest Library and you head toward the poetry or fiction section and you pull down a a book of poetry, you're going to read that with a different interpretive lens than if you pull out a book on history where you'll be reading that more literally. And you'll do that without even thinking about it, right? Why? Because the genre of the material you're reading unconsciously gives you a signal to read it this way. When I'm reading the New York Times, I know I'm reading fiction. When I, I mean, that's my clue when I see the banner. Uh, but you see how interpretation, this interpretive move I made, was based upon the literature type that I was reading. And so the science of interpretation is called hermeneutics to explain why do you do that then and not later, especially with, especially with ancient texts. Why do we... How do we know when to put on the critical eye of history or science, if I'm reading science, versus the poetic eye? You know, what's an, what's an analogy or what's not? And so uh, that's what this is. And John Cardinal Newman was one of many theologians in the 19th century who began to try to understand better what does development mean in the context of the development of doctrine. And he likened it to a child growing up to be a man because there was this authentic development that the child doesn't turn into an elephant, but keeps its nature, keeps its principles while maturing and growing up and achieving the purpose of of its nature. And so too the church grows up and develops in a similar way. Doesn't mean a child looks like a man later, just as the church of the first century doesn't look like Pius XII wearing a tiara, being hoisted into St. Peter's in Rome, there's a maturation that was going on there. But the question is, what is authentic maturation or development, and what's more time-bound can be discarded once it's not useful? And so he started developing this idea in a book called The Development of Doctrine about authentic development looks like this, true to its form, true to its nature and principles. It will accrue other things over time, some of which contribute to that nature and other things which will need to be curtailed later when they're not appropriate. Cardinal Ratzinger and then later as Pope Benedict XVI will even elaborate on this further. What do we mean when we talk about development of doctrine and what are authentic developments versus mutations or corruptions? 
One last uh, thing, and these were terms that were popular at the time, and you might still hear about them now. Aggiornamento is Italian for updating, opening the windows of the church, letting the fresh air in. You might remember that expression long ago. Uh, the church was updating with Vatican II, opening the windows, letting the fresh air in. Another term used at the council is a French term, ressourcement, which means a return to primary sources, a return to the fathers of the church, a renewed interest in biblical studies, which the church perhaps had neglected prior to Vatican II. Uh, and so we go back to go forward is the point, the union or the unison of aggiornamento updating and ressourcement going back to the sources is we go back to the sources so that we can intelligently embrace and, and understand how we evangelize culture today. Just repeating the same forms of the mass or of our theologies, our catechisms, didn't seem to stop two major world wars in the 20th century in largely Catholic, Catholic Christian countries. Something was wrong, something was off. And so as we've talked about in this course, uh, and particularly with the liturgy, we need to restore active participation of the laity in the Mass. And so that's an example of this aggiornamento going back to go forward. Two quick examples. One, the reintroduction of RCIA at Sunday Mass. So the candidates now assemble at Sunday Masses. That never happened for a thousand years, actually 1,500 years, that never happened. That was a practice of the fathers of the church because these members in the RCIA class who are going to be baptized or confirmed or first communion were part of the Christian Catholic community. They weren't some side issue uh, at all. And so one of the reforms of Vatican II was to bring back the RCIA back into church and into Sunday celebration. Another example would be the permanent deacons. Another are retrieving prayers from the third century and inserting them back into the prayers at the Mass. So these are all examples of aggiornamento and ressourcement. I mention here these two bottom bullets that Vatican II was the first council that occurred in the media age and as I've mentioned in other classes the media at the time most were certainly interested in and committed to uh, pushing what they heard in a left liberal direction and distorting the messages of the council. And there are many books that have been written on this on how that distortion occurred. At the same time, what grew up uh, was a group of theologians also committed to twisting the conceptions and, and principles of Vatican II for popular consumption. And so there grew up this comment of the spirit of Vatican II over and against the texts of Vatican II. And the spirit of Vatican II was its true flower, the true development coming out of that council. And that has continued in our time, obviously, this distortion of what the Catholic Church teaches. And it's, it's continued for, for 60 plus years. The good news is we've had popes, helpfully, who were at the council, Paul VI, St. Paul VI, John Paul II, St. John Paul II, and Pope Benedict XVI, who were at the council, who could help us with its proper interpretation. So let's look at what uh, Pope Benedict XVI wrote in his address to the Curia uh, right, uh, right after he was uh, made Pope. Quote, the last event of this year on, on, which I wish, on which I wish to reflect here is the celebration of the conclusion of the Second Vatican Council 40 years ago. The question arises, why has the implementation of the council in large parts of the church thus far been so difficult? Well, it all depends on the correct interpretation of the council, or as we would say today, on its proper hermeneutics. There's that word. The correct key to interpretation and application. The problems in its implementation arose from the fact that two contrary hermeneutics came face to face and quarreled with each other. One caused confusion, 
the other silently but more and more visibly bore and is bearing fruit. On the one hand, there is an interpretation that I would call a hermeneutic of discontinuity and rupture. It has frequently availed itself of the sympathy, sympathies of the mass media and also one trend of modern theology. On the other, there is the hermeneutic of reform, of renewal in the continuity of the one subject church which the Lord has given to us. She, the church, is a subject which increases in time and develops, yet always remaining the same, the one subject of the journeying people of God. The hermeneutic of discontinuity risks ending in a split between the pre-conciliar church and the post-conciliar church. It asserts that the texts of the council as such do not yet express the true spirit of the council. It claims that they are the result of, old, of compromises in which to reach unanimity, it was found necessary to keep and reconfirm many old things that are now pointless. However, the true spirit of the council is not to be found in those compromises, but instead in the impulses toward the new that are contained in the text. So spirit of Vatican II, what the council fathers actually agreed to. This is the hermeneutic of discontinuity and rupture that Pope Benedict is talking about. And it's one side of this problem. These innovations alone were supposed to represent the, the true spirit of the council and starting from and in conformity with them, it would be possible to move ahead. Precisely because the text would only imperfectly reflect the true spirit of the council and its newness, it would be necessary to go courageously beyond the text and make room for the newness in which the council's deepest intention would be expressed, even if it were still vague. So think of all of the things that came out of Vatican II almost immediately, whether it was the smashing of churches and, and communion rails, uh, destroying stained glass windows, all according to the spirit of Vatican II, which had nothing to do with the spirit of Vatican II whatsoever. In a word, it would be necessary not to follow the text of the council, but its spirit. In this way, obviously, a vast margin was left open for the questions on how this spirit should subsequently be defined, and room was constantly made for every whim. Think of all the experimentation uh, at the Mass, which is really our most concrete experiences of Vatican II, all the theology that came out that was a bit bizarre, uh, and so on. So as Benedict wraps up this portion, uh, he, he writes, the nature of a council as such is therefore basically misunderstood by these types of people. In this way, it is considered as a sort of constituent that eliminates an old constitution and creates a new one. However, the constituent assembly needs a mandator. Th these are translations, keep in mind, of, of Latin and German. And then confirmation by the mandator, in other words, the people the constitution must serve. The fathers of the council had no such mandate, and no one had ever given them one, nor could anyone have given them one because the essential constitution of the church comes from the Lord and was given to us so that we might attain eternal life and starting from this perspective be able to illuminate life and time and time itself. So the, human, the hermeneutic of discontinuity is countered by the hermeneutic of reform as it was presented first by Pope John XXIII in his speech inaugurating the council, which we read, if you might recall, in the first class, and later by Paul VI in his discourse for the council's conclusion on December 7th, 1965. So what did John XXIII write at the beginning of Vatican II? It's worth repeating. I, I read this to you in class one, but it's worth repeating. So this is John the 23rd's opening statement in 1962, October. The major interest of the ecumenical council is this, the sacred heritage of Christian truth be safeguarded and expounded with greater efficacy. What is needed and what is everyone imbued with a truly Christian and Catholic and apostolic spirit craves today is that this doctrine shall be more widely known, more deeply understood, and more penetrating in its effect on men's moral lives. What is needed is that this certain and immutable doctrine to which the faithful owe obedience be studied afresh and reformulated in contemporary terms. So immutable doctrine, 
that is reformulated. Therein lies the development. That, that's an infinite perfect God who doesn't change mediates through Jesus Christ to us. God doesn't change, but we change in our appropriation, in our realization of what the faith means. That's what's being gotten at here. For this deposit of faith or truths which are contained in our time-honored teachings is one thing. The manner in which these truths are set forth, with their meaning preserved intact, is something else. You see the, the polarities now by which development can proceed. We have the deposit of faith, which will be reflected on by the church over time, which deepens its understanding of what was revealed and comes up with new formulations that speak to that time and resolve perhaps controversies of that time. That's what we're really talking about when we talk about the development of doctrine. So, there are two hermeneutics that uh, Pope Benedict talked about. The hermeneutic of essential discontinuity and rupture. This was decisively rejected, as I mentioned here, by the three popes that followed in succession. It was embraced by, as I mentioned, theologians, parish coordinators, others, that they think that the church and the liturgy is something they make when in fact it's something they receive, as, as we've talked about in the class on the liturgy in particular, but also on the church. The church is first Christ's church that he founded and gave it its nature and essential character. I should mention in passing that the, the folks that followed Marcel Lefebvre, the Lefebvreites, the St. Pius X Society, are also in this camp of discontinuity and rupture. They felt, and many still feel, that Vatican II was discontinuous with what went before, was a rupture, not just because of the liturgical reforms, but for the decree on religious liberty, which we will talk about in a moment. So the Lefebvreites, as I've called them, are in the same camp as liberals vis-a-vis uh, -vis Vatican II and this hermeneutic of rupture which is ultimately a form of Protestantism when you think about it. Meaning, I'm going, me, myself, and I are going to pick and choose what's authentic outside of the apostolic succession, outside of sacred tradition. That's the awful truth that all sides need to face. Instead, with Pope Benedict, we embrace the hermeneutic of reform and continuity. And the reform is renewal of these unchanging truths recast in language that speaks to a contemporary age without compromising those unchanging truths. Very hard to do. Very difficult. It's, it's much harder than the alternatives, which is embracing the past and not letting go of its forms. I'm not talking about the substance of the truth. I'm talking about its expressions, its formulations, its practices. Pope Benedict makes possible discontinuity in the sense of the letter or the formulations it's themselves can be recast to reflect that immutable truth better in the time or of the controversy of that time. So let's look at uh, some concrete examples. Before I do, though, uh, I'm going to quote to you a, a text. I'll come back to this because this could be heavy sledding, but I, I want to give you examples and then we'll come back if, if there's time. Let's look at something we're all familiar with, which is in the Creed we pray at Mass every Sunday, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. Oops consubstantial with the Father. Oops, you know, you see what's going on there. How do we express God and his relationship of the Father and the Son as divine? This was fought over for centuries. And finally, it didn't get much play because up until Constantine liberated the church from persecution, 
theologians could only kind of muse within their locales. Uh, but once the church had the freedom to finally express itself publicly, the controversies came out. And so how do we explain Jesus' relationship to the Father? In a culture which was largely imbued by Greek and Roman philosophy. And what they did in that council, 325 AD, was they selected a term from Greek philosophy not found in the New Testament. How can that be? Not found in the New Testament. Homo usian. Same substance. Homo, same. Usian. It's a tough one to translate in Greek philosophy. It can mean being. It can mean substance, and it, it confused the situation between the Latins and the Greeks. But that was the expression they used, not found in sacred scripture. An innovation, a discontinuity in formulation, but not in the immutable truth that Jesus is God. They used a new term to express an immutable truth. You see what I'm getting at now? This is a hermeneutic of continuity, development of doctrine, with discontinuity in formulation. You see what's going on there? But it clarifies, as I put here, that relationship between God as Father and God as Son in a way that goes beyond just the poetical language of the New Testament text and achieves a kind of, as I put it, a universality of Greek philosophy for all cultures. The language of science now is being employed to advance theological faith understandings. Sometimes it's called the spoils of Egypt. In the Old Testament, when, when uh, the Jewish people were leaving Egypt, they took their stuff with them so that they could wander for 40 years. And this expression of using secular material for spiritual and theological ends are called the spoils of Egypt. In theology, that's what this is. When Aquinas used Aristotle, it's called the spoils of Egypt. And so what the church is doing here, like the Old Testament people of old did, is they used the spoils of the secular world to advance their cause. So that's what's going on here. I, I should mention a little fun little Greek joke, um, Arius the heretic at the time was advancing homoi usian. And homoi means like in substance, like in being, but not the same. Where homo means same being as the father, homoi usian meant he's similar to the father, but he's not God. So at your barbecue cookouts, you now know the origin of there's not an iota's difference. Because <laughs> the iota is the difference between homo usian and homoi usian. Okay, that's... Our professors always would use these jokes because we were always just as tired as you are of all this. <laughs> so let's look at some contemporary, more contemporary than the 4th century, uh, the 19th century, Pope Pius IX and the decree on religious liberty of Vatican II. And I'm putting side by side on this chart. Uh, don't worry, I'll read it if you cannot. Uh, Pius IX published in 1864 something called the Syllabus of Errors. And it was an appendix to a, a document he was publishing combating the revolutionary spirit of his time in the 19th century. And we spent a few minutes just talking about the church being under attack. Uh, eventually, uh, the popes at this time would have to flee Rome when the German troops were coming when the French fled from Italy. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was hovering in, wanted to actually was fighting against the United Italy the Pope actually did not want a united Italy either. It got complicated. His, his papal armies were not able to defend him, so he fled Rome. So this is the context of him cataloging the syllabus of errors. 
And so uh, these errors he described in this section as indifferentism and latitudinarianism. Hard to say. I thought it was a yoga pose, you know. <laughs> Latitude, no, okay. So here's what Pius IX wrote. Every man is free to embrace, he's condemning these propositions. Every man is free to embrace and profess that religion, which guided by the light of reason, he, should, he shall consider true. So that's kind of an indifferent relativism he's going after. Another one he condemns is, man may in the observance of any religion, whatever, find the way of eternal salvation and arrive at eternal salvation. He's condemning that. He's also condemning number 17 here on the far right. Good hope, at least, is to be entertained of the eternal salvation of all those who are not at all in the true church of Christ. And the last one I put here, Protestantism is nothing more than another form of the same true Christian religion in which form it is given to please God equally as in the Catholic Church. So he's condemning those propositions, correctly so, I might add. And Vatican II did nothing to undo any of those statements. You note the form of them are not very inviting or tasty for an outsider to read. And so the style of Vatican II was not to write its text that way. So let's see how Vatican II writes about its declaration on religious liberty in 1965. This is this bottom section. Quote, first the council professes its belief that God himself has made known to mankind the way in which men are to serve him and thus be saved in Christ and come to blessedness. We believe that this one true religion subsists in the Catholic and Apostolic Church, to which the Lord Jesus committed the duty of spreading it abroad among all men. We, we all agree with that. Pius IX would agree with that. It continues. This Vatican Council declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. This freedom means that all men are to be immune from coercion on the part of individuals or of social groups and of any human power, in such wise that no one is to be forced to act in a manner contrary to his own beliefs, whether privately or publicly, whether alone or in association with others, within due limits. Probably those due limits are things like Christian scientists who might let their children die by withholding certain medical care or religions that might practice child sacrifice, for example. Um, and as we know, you don't have to belong to a religion to want to practice child sacrifice in the womb. Uh, the council further goes on. The council further declares that the right to religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person as this dignity is known through the revealed word of God and by reason. The human itself. person to religious this freedom is to be recognized in the constitutional law whereby society is governed and thus it is to become a civil right. You see how those two formulations of truths can hang together actually. There's no indifferentism here. There is no embrace of relativism here that so troubled Marcel Lefebvre. Uh, and so if we, if we continue, we see that the right to be free from coercion by civil authority in religious matters is not based upon relativism or indifferentism or this idea of freedom of conscience untethered to the truth that Pius IX was condemning. Two trains passing in the night, related issues, but totally different formulations, not contradicting each other in their essence. And so this right to be free from coercion is based upon the dignity of the human person to freely choose their path. So Pius IX gets a lot of uh, criticism for his statements in that syllabus of errors. It's a very famous statement that enemies of the church will use to show how silly the Pope and the Catholic Church can be. Uh, but in fact, uh, it, what he was attacking, he was right to attack. In the statement on religious freedom is also true and in no way contradicts that. 
And, and the truth is, uh, the church would always kind of tend to play a game of heads we win, tails you lose. If, if, if Catholics were the ultimate majority in a country, the church was just fine with the state passing laws preventing uh, the existence of other religions. Conversely, if the church Catholics were minorities, they felt it was a civil right to have freedom of worship. So the church for a thousand years played that, or after the Protestant Reformation, played that game. And, and that was not, it's understandable, but uh, not particularly attractive. Quoting from Fields, who is in the bibliography, under pressure from ho forces hostile to the church, one of its constituent elements may assume a disproportionate importance. What we were talking about earlier, about these statements, about Protestantism being equal, and so on. And what Fields is talking about is, in history, sometimes things mushroom up disproportionate to their true measure related to the doctrine. And this is an example of this. The church of the 19th century was struggling to find its voice on religious freedom, on the, the natural rights a human person has. This is one of the reasons why in the 20th century the church struggled to oppose fascism in certain countries in the 20th century. So to, to pick examples, you think of Franco in Spain. Uh, Marcel Lefebvre was just fine with him and defended him. Uh, he, Marcel Lefebvre, defended the Vichy France in, in World War II. Uh, the, the, there's a mindset here uh, that informed all of these uh, speculations. And for those of you who study French history, uh, ancien regime, a monarchical political order is best. Uh, error has no rights, if, if you remember some of these formulations. So we can oppress religious minorities because error has no rights. What the council is affirming in, in full transparency is that humanity has rights, <laughs> which is a development of doctrine. And it's an authentic development of doctrine. So, uh, but, as I mentioned, the para council, you know, the side council, the spirit of Vatican II twists all of this, of course. And as I mentioned, they twisted this one, freedom from coercion by civil authority, to mean, as a Catholic, I can't be coerced by the Catholic Church to believe. I can dissent authentically, faithfully, which is what happened. That is a rupture. That is a foul mutation of what the church taught on religious liberty. And it still goes on today. So Vatican II shouldn't be blamed in its text. It can be blamed in the leadership that implemented it. Okay, so those are, if you think about it, those are a couple of examples of what I call development of doctrine, but reformulations or discontinuous language. The language is discontinuous, homo usian, or religious liberty, rights of the person. But the truths are immutable. And the church reflects and discovers not new truths, but truths that are embedded in what Jesus Christ revealed. The dignity of the human person as an individual. So, as I mentioned before, it took 130 years plus to resolve just the, the controversies about who is Jesus? How is he God and man? Does he have one mind or two minds? Does he have one will or two wills? Does he have a human soul? Th that took centuries of controversy, fighting, I mean literal fighting, and killing as well. Uh, and so, you could say that uh, 
that's even in a time of relative cultural stability in the Roman Empire, in the latter stages in the West and in the East. But if you think about it, Vatican II took place at a time of secular rupture, of discontinuity, of what went before as well. So compounded by this. And so the quote here by Fields again is, if we agree that the council worked under a, her a hermeneutic of doctrinal and theological reform, still it was released into a world sociologically entering the throes of its own hermeneutic of rupture. We need to continually inquire into what extent the secular hermeneutic holds the sacred hostage. And we spent an entire course, I think it was 2018, on Pope Benedict's writings on how the sacred is under attack, philosophically, culturally, psychologically, and how to combat that. Uh, and obviously, one of the ways to combat that is the liturgy and the beauty and grandeur of the liturgy, but we'll, we'll touch on that a bit later. Uh, I should mention, uh, just in passing, that uh, after the Council of Chalcedon in 451, many of the bishops from Egypt and other parts of the Middle East that we would now call Saudi Arabia said at the time in 451 AD, we can't go back to our people with this. <laughs> they'll, they'll throw us out because it felt like to the Middle Eastern mind in those regions that we had a God in triplicate, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three gods? And this guy was God as well? That seems blasphemous. And so within, talk about uh, rupture. Within 200 years of that council ending, that entire area was Islamic, monotheistic. So the church has always been buffeted by these crises that occur at moments of great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in these councils. 451, our, our highest statement of who Jesus Christ is, God and man, creates a crisis that in 200 years later births the Islamic Republic. So we shouldn't simply make this equation between Vatican II happened and that's when the church fell apart. As if texts can cause that. And what this quote is getting at is that the culture in the West, in the 60s, was already had the elements of its own discontinuity, its own rupture already brewing. Okay, so Taking a breath, any comments or questions before I jump into this last concept on Aquinas and the analogy of being, being the interpretive clue for the entire council? I thought it would be, I, I hesitated to do this, but I thought this is a sharp group. <laughs> and and uh, they will be able to track with this because it is so fundamental to the council. Why don't we keep rolling? All righty. Analogy of being and participation. Good heavens. So Aquinas and Aristotle before him talk about how we talk about things. And when we're talking about analogy or ways of talking about things that are similar but different, we have several ways that that can occur. One is what's called univocal. One voice, one way of speaking. John is a man, Peter is a man. The word man is used univocally. It's predicated in one way. It means the same thing for Peter and John. When someone says you're being equivocal, you're being confusing, deceptive, we're using a word in two different ways at the same time. So I put money in the bank. I hit a bank shot in basketball. The word bank is being used in two different ways, two different meanings entirely. That's equivocation. If I ask you, uh, what'd you do with my car? And you say, well, I had it, but then I gave it to someone else. I'll, I might say you're being equivocal. 
you're saying two things that don't even make any sense to my question. The third way of speaking is analogical speech. Good food, good shoes, good person, good picture, a good time, a good place. What do all these things have in common? You know, what's a good time to meet? Is very different than what's a good place to meet. But they have that connotation of good, meaning fittingness, appropriate, excellent. So there's almost like a genus term good with all these different participations of good food, good company, good shoes. But, so we have difference and unity in analogical speech. You with me? This is the key for Aquinas to talk about now the vertical way of talking about the order of being. So we've now kind of talked about how we use speech analogically, good food, good time, good place. Let's talk about the order of being. And God, and Aquinas says there's two ways of speaking about the order of being about God. One way is negatively, because we're finite, God is infinite. We can say God is not a body, God is not in time, God is not confused, God is not surprised. When, when someone is graduating from high school, God is not expectantly wondering, I wonder where they're going to go to college. He knows. He's out of time. So God is not a body. So that's one way we can talk authentically about God. Another way is analogically, where we say God is good, God is merciful. God is just. God is love. We mean that is we have these finite experiences of those things, but God has them without limits. He has them preeminently. And this is core metaphysics, but it's also core fundamental theology, that these are the two ways we can intelligently talk about God, negatively, negating any limit on God, and talking about qualities that we view as great, but they're without limit in God. Okay, so the point here is that uh, this structure of thinking, analogy of being, is what hovers over the theological framework of Vatican II. And I, I always give examples to illustrate this. Remember in the class on Revelation, Jesus Christ is the definitive revelation of God. He is God's Son. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus Christ is the definitive revelation of God, and revelation can exist outside. What's going on there? You have the perfect the perfect revelation of Jesus, and you have the participation in the world. That the devout Hindu can find God in his circumstances through Christ without even knowing Jesus Christ. You see how the analogy of being is at work there. Let's look at another example. Christ's body of the church. We spent class two on it. Christ's body of the church, which we just read, is the church of Christ that he instituted as his body to the world to reveal his saving gospel. And grace can operate outside of its visible structure. There's an analogy, an analogy of being going on there, of the perfect being participated in by Protestant faiths, by other religious traditions, and so forth. You see what's at work here? This language of analogy is what's at work in these documents as its core theological framework. Another one that's in the document on the church. Mary is cited as, among other titles that she receives, co-redemptrix with Jesus. Now this at times gets distorted out of proportion. Jesus Christ is the one redeemer of mankind. And Mary participates in that, in her proportion, in her measure. You see how the analogy of being is being played out? The concept of the perfect, the good, being participated in good time, good place, good food, good shoes? 
and then the perfect in the church or in redemption gets participated in in different ways. Last one, priesthood of all believers, a new conceptual formulation. We have the ministerial priesthood and we have the priesthood of believers. What's the analogy? Christ is the perfect priest. We participate in that differently as lay people or as the ministerial priesthood. Another example of analogy and participation. The last one I mention here, well, I could mention many more, baptism. We have the baptism in water. I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That is the perfect, which is participated in imperfectly by the baptism of desire. This is analogous talk. This is inclusive talk, authentic inclusivity, the inclusivity of God to all reality. He's facing it. Versus propositions that we're condemning, which is more dialectical. You see, the, the true spirit of Vatican II is the embrace of the world to evangelize it, to make known Jesus Christ and not to create artificial barriers to that embrace. So this analogy of being, this core concept, again, from metaphysics, is actually at work in evangelization, in the core structure of the documents of Vatican II. We have the perfect, which is participated in imperfectly, which doesn't mean the perfect in the Catholic Church is just one of many options. That's always the false conclusion. Because the church is Christ corporately on earth. The church of Christ subsists in the Catholic church. Baptism is water and the Holy Spirit. Christ is the priest and we participate in it. One does not dilute the other. So I mentioned this was an ambitious program that Vatican II launched. Uh, hugely ambitious. Uh, but as I mentioned, Christ touches all elements of secular, godless society. Whether they want to be touched or not, Christ is there. So as, I, as, as we proceed here then, uh, as, as a way of wrap up, and this is, not, this is a widely shared opinion the major policies of Vatican II have yet to be fully implemented. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And it's not surprising, given the history of the church. We might be halfway through the birthing process of implementing Vatican II. The universal call to holiness, liturgical reform, restoring the preeminence of Christ's act of adoration in which we participate. There it is again. Remember the class on the liturgy? What is the liturgy? What is the Mass in essence? It is Christ's adoration of the Father. We participate in that. But it's not ours. We participate in Christ's act of adoration. We participate in Christ's body, the church. And as I mentioned here, the discontinuities of Vatican II were introduced into a secular culture that itself was going through a breakdown. And a breakdown that has resulted in what I call a functional atheism. What do I mean by a functional atheism, both in the church and in secular culture? I mean that when, if you look in the mirror each morning and think that there's no principle or law above what I see in the mirror, or I do not define my good or my truths outside of that face I see in the mirror, that's a good working definition of atheism. You might say words to God, but you're really living your life, uh, as Cardinal Newman once said, we don't so much live our lives to please God, we live our lives to please ourselves without displeasing God. <laughs> 
and that's a good working definition of a functional. There's no principle outside myself that I'm accountable to. That's functional atheism, which is why the liturgical reform is so important, because the basic orientation of Christ's adoration of the Father is toward the end times, toward eschatology. It is future looking, which is, uh, if we beautify that, if we make that reverent, if we make that spiritual, we'll take people's minds out of the secular here and now and point them toward what is transcendent, what is good, what is beautiful, what is true. So that reform of the liturgy is fundamental to reforming culture. As I put here, this is also a leadership issue. And whether it's in business or in religion, religious matters, effective leadership is about establishing the right priorities for the organization. If the things you select to go after as priorities don't create saints, they're the wrong priorities. If your priorities are to get along and, and be, as I put it, agents of a atheistic biomedical state, as we've gone through in the last two years, with the uh, pathetic acquiescence to secular authority on whether masses can be celebrated, whether funerals can be had, whether visits can be made to the sick, is disgusting. So we need leaders who set the right priorities and are willing to put it on the line to do that. As Cardinal Robert Sarah has said many times, it's, it's God or nothing. Truth and courage. So I'd like to end where we began with St. Basil. Uh, you recall right at the beginning, he was talking about the naval battle and comparing the controversies of his time to a naval battle. And how we, in a naval battle you have chaos, it's noisy, you can't hear the commands of the captain of the ship. Everyone's fighting. <laughs> He's describing our times as he was describing his times. Here's how he wraps up that section of, of that work on the confusion after the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Wherefore, we too are undismayed at the cloud of our enemies, and resting on our hope on the aid of the Spirit, have we with all boldness proclaimed the truth. Had I not done so, it would truly have been terrible that the blasphemers of the Spirit should so easily be emboldened in their attack upon the true religion, and that we should shrink from the service of that doctrine, which by the tradition of the fathers has been preserved by an unbroken sequence of memory to our own day. We are heirs to St. Basil, to this saving message, inheritance in Christ Jesus the Lord. Like Jeremiah of the Old Testament, he didn't want to be a prophet, but he couldn't hold it in. They threw him in a well. <laughs> he couldn't hold it in. And as we read in John's Gospel, Jesus with the money changers, zeal for your house consumes me. That is our mission, to begin again the implementation of Vatican II. So with that, that wraps up the prepared comments. Uh, do we have time now for, we do have time for questions. Questions, yes? It appears that just about every council had the same uh, right. experience. So the, the question for the, the YouTube audience as well, because they can't always hear, is the appropriateness maybe of a Vatican III to correct or address what Vatican II might have left open. Right, because uh, it might be 200 years from now before right, we get, get there. Right, right. And, and I think part of the answer is that's what in particular John Paul II and Pope Benedict are, were up to, which is to clarify what the reforms of Vatican II mean in practice uh, and to try to reel back in some of the innovations that were not true to the council. And that's an ongoing thing.
you, you may compound the problem by having another Vatican Council, but to your point, society has moved even further beyond what anyone could have thought of in 1965, both culturally, technologically, globally. Uh, and so uh, it's unclear, though, that the principles of Vatican II st still are quite relevant for that. Um, and so I think often what in practice happens is specific synods to address a p specific issue is usually more practical than anything else because the change is so fast. Other questions? So there are yes. permanent deacons. Uh, I wouldn't say there's a flood, uh, but um, this is something that was resuscitated uh, to assist uh, the church and the priests with various sacramental duties and just ministries of presence that deacons provide witnessing marriages uh, you know, as a sacrament, baptisms, uh, those sorts of hospital visits uh, or working with groups in the parish or outside the parish. So it's, it's certainly something that's quite helpful uh, and has been widely uh, deployed throughout uh, all the dioceses. So I would say it's an ex a good example of, a, of an accomplishment of Vatican II. Yes? Sure, so the question is, how think about the uh, offering of communion to public uh, officials who scandalize the faithful with positions they hold in public, as distinct from private individuals who you suspect is a real nasty person. Why are they going up? So the notion of scandal is relevant to the question of how think about this. And I'm sorry? And who decides? Well, that's the easy one. The, the bishop in his diocese decides and should decide. The question is, what should he decide? <laughs> and this is my opinion. The U.S. bishops obviously differ on this. Some say you should withhold communion. Others do not. I, I think those who say you should not hold it don't characterize the issue about why I think we should withhold it correctly. They think it's a politicization of the Eucharist. And in fact, it's a, actually a recognition that the Eucharist is a celebration of an identity, of a unity in which people like Pelosi and Biden and the others do not participate in by their public stances on the death of unborn children. And so uh, that's the point. It's not about making this about politics. It's about proclaiming a unity and enforcing that unity that does not exist in Pelosi and Biden. And, and because the bishops who think you should give communion to these officials, they can't really defend their point of view, so they have to kind of characterize it as making this about politics. It has nothing to do with politics. It has everything to do about at mass we are celebrating a unity in the truth. And part of that unity is the affirmation that these unborn children are being destroyed in the womb and that Catholic politicians who take stances on these basic issues of morals and of life in public take positions contrary to the teaching of the church on the value of human life should not present themselves for communion because they are not celebrating the faith identity that we celebrate at Mass. Is what a mortal sin? Espousing the validity or, or acceptance of abortion. It's, that's a very good question. I would say this, and, and we, we covered this actually in the social teaching of the church in 2015. I think, and this is in the area of cooperation in moral theology, and there's two types of cooperation. Formal, I'm handing the doctor the scalpel and material cooperation. I am, and this is, there are gradations now. I'm the nurse standing next to the doctor handing him the scalpel. I'm not committing the abortion. Let's say they use the scalpel. I'm, I'm the janitor who cleans the floors of the clinic every night. I, I'm cooperating in some sense. It's not the same kind of cooperation. It's, it's called remote, perhaps. Maybe it's the only job I can get. 
or I shovel snow and I clear the driveway to the abortion clinic. That's another kind of cooperation, isn't it? It's material cooperation, but it's remote. Now, let's take your case. The legislator who promotes legislation that funds Planned Parenthood and abortion clinics, is that remote material cooperation or is it proximate? I'm the nurse handing the scalpel, which would be a mortal sin. I would argue that it is a mortal sin if it's done knowingly, that if you support legislation and are instrumental in its passage that funds abortion, you are guilty of proximate material cooperation and if done with sufficient knowledge and consent is a mortal sin. And, and if I vote for him, have I committed a mortal sin? Yes. You see how now the causality gets further diluted. You, you are suspicious. <laughs> you wouldn't be there if I didn't vote for him. Right. But your causality, suppose you liked him on climate issues too. Right, 95%. Right, right. right. And so that's the issue. And the issue that legislatures face is what if a funding of Planned Parenthood is, is tacked on to a bill that does other things that are great? And so it, it gets complicated. I still think you're never justified in, in approving legislation. I don't care if it funds the military. You break it apart or no vote. Other, other, one, one, inside voices, other questions? Yes. Um, so what is meant by when they, people who kind of, you know, don't come out and say you shouldn't, the bishops, rather they take it, oh, I'm being pastoral. So we, right. And, and this falls into the habit that the bishops fell into after Humane Vitae, if you recall. So, Remember last class and in, in past classes, the U.S. bishops got into the habit of saying, this is what the church teaches and follow your conscience. And, right. and so don't bring it up again, please. No. No, I can't be more clear than that. This is what the church teaches. Don't ask me. Follow, right, don't ask me because we're not going to talk about it. Uh, and, and this kind of falls into that same habit, unfortunately. And what's great is that some of the new bishops, uh, it's changed a little bit, but uh, are beginning to take on culture directly. Uh, you have the Archbishop of Los Angeles who uh, is refusing communion. The, the Archbishop of San Francisco refusing communion. Uh, so it's starting to happen uh, of bishops realizing it's not 1955 anymore, that we are in a corrupt, atheistic, culture that needs to be taken on and fought directly. One more question. You're getting me in trouble for the, the YouTube. If, if we don't have this program next year, you'll know what happens. So, well, great. Great to see you all. Thanks again for another great year. Right. And thanks for the cake. <laughs>